I have the pleasure and the honor to be able to introduce our international director, Richard Peck. Richard Peck has served as a club president for the Norwalk Kiwa, is it Kiwana Club and as Division 25 Lieutenant Governor for the Kiwanas International. He's a dedicated Toastmaster for the last seven years. Richard has been a member of his home club, Nutmeg, in Woodbridge, Connecticut, since 2006. He has held a numerous <laughs> high-profile leadership positions while he's been in Toastmasters and has attained the distinguished Toastmaster designation. That is the highest level of educational achievement in the organization. As a member of the Toastmasters International Director Board, Richard is a working ambassador for the organization. He works with the board to develop, support, and modify the policies and procedures that guide Toastmasters International in fulfilling its mission. In his spare time, in his spare time, he enjoys traveling, photography, and studying world cultures. In his session today, the B's to becoming, the three B's to becoming a successful leader, Richard will share several simple principles that will greatly increase your odds of being successful. Please welcome our international director, Richard Peck. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You hear me? Good, good. The mic's on. Sharon, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's an honor for me to be here today, and it's a little bit bittersweet. Uh, this is my last attendance at this conference as your international director. I, my term rolls off in August, so this is a little extra special for me. I intentionally planned on having it at the end of my term, so thank you for the gracious hospitality that you've shown me. As I was thinking about the conference and the theme, Back to School, it terrified me. School terrified me. <laughs> Going back to school probably terrifies you. But I wanted to align my sessions with that theme. So this morning, I'm going to give you a Leadership 101 class. There will be homework and an open book test. <laughs> There's not enough coffee on this side of the room over here because they're not getting the jokes. <laughs> and then this afternoon, I'm going to give you a philosophy 101. Everyone's thrilled about philosophy, right? So we're going to do that this afternoon. My goal is that when you take the information away from these sessions, just like all the speakers, that there's some golden nugget, as Joe said, that you can use. Something that you'll be able to take back to your clubs or your personal life and apply them. Sharon alluded to my leadership journey here within Toastmasters, but let me back up a little bit and kind of set the stage from where I started at to where I am now so that you can see that what I'm about to show you, the philosophies and the building blocks that I'm going to show you, I actually have applied and they do work. And if you follow them, although there's no guarantee that you will be successful, depending on what your measure of success is, this will help you to get to that track. Now, you may not hit your target as a leader, but that does not necessarily mean that you weren't successful. Did you learn something from that experience? Is there something that you can apply later on to change that outcome if you had to do it again? If so, then you're successful. If you set your team behind you for success going forward, you're successful. It may not have been that you met your target. So you have to take a look at success a little differently. As Sharon stated, I started Toastmasters in 2006, June 1st, where's Tom Fitch? Tom's in the back, I joined Tom's club. It was pulled me in right at the last minute so he could make Distinguished. So he was, every time I get up here, it's like, yeah, we're Distinguished. So we did that. In 2007, late 2007, I'd only been in Toastmasters for a year, Will Ryan, past district governor, I don't see Will here, called, called me up and asked me if I would fill in for an area governor that couldn't do their job. 
I was honored. I'd only been in Toastmasters for a year and a half. Of course, I went into it blind, just like most of us do. We don't know what the leadership role is. So six months into it, I said, okay, business meetings up. I'm going to run again for area governor and get it right the second time. And until Karen Von Canal, who was the following district governor, called me up and said, I need you to run for division governor. Okay, that sounds good. Still don't know anything about what I'm doing. <laughs> so six months area governor, a year as division governor. Then I worked through the senior team. 2012, it became time to consider a future journey within the organization. And I enlisted the talents of my dear friend in the back, Rich Kucher, to say, let's make a run for international director. I was the underdog when you look at statistics. And that's why I can tell you that saying success doesn't necessarily mean success. So we were the underdog going into the elections. There was no way we should have won this. <laughs> no way we should have won this. But we did in the closest election possible, because I used the philosophy that I'm about to show you. We served the two years for your organization based on this. And whatever the future holds, we're gonna do this again. So as we go forward, think about how this applies to you currently as a leader or your future leadership roles. Also look back at leaders that you've I don't like to use the word followed, but you followed, and see if you can find the ones that they missed that may have been handled differently. And we are now up to five Bs. After I thought about the first three, I figured they didn't really do it justice to have just those three, so we've got a couple more built into there. So I know it's a little hard to see over there. I'm going to try to stand back a little bit so everyone can see the screen properly. Okay. The Bs to becoming a successful leader. And you notice that these is in parentheses are in uh, quotes there. That's because everything that you have to apply begins with the letter B. It's also in red because red is the color of leadership. So these are all things to help you reinforce this thought process. Now, through my six years as a leader, I've learned one thing. There is no, no, magical formula out there for becoming a successful leader. I've looked at all of these. None of them apply. <laughs> I couldn't even make E equal MC squared, the universal, apply to anything. Um, but I have learned that there are some basic components that you can use that will help you be successful. Now, unfortunately, there are some techniques that leaders naturally use that they think will allow them to be successful. So here's the first one. One leader, lots of followers, success. Mm, you could have one leader standing in the middle of a room and everyone's standing around them and you're not going anywhere, you're not getting anything. So uh, not successful. I've seen this. I've probably been a person who's done this while I was learning to grow. So that one's not going to work. The next one I, I find the more common one. It's the lead me, I'm a follower. Anyone know the lead me, I'm a follower? Okay, that's the lead me, I'm a follower approach right there. Um, you don't know where you're going, but you're following. Uh, for those of you who may have a hard time seeing, that's the cliff right there. Not a good place to go. Um, so that's that lead me, I'm a, follow me, I'm a leader philosophy. And that one there does not work. Nah, there you go. S sound effects are greatly appreciated. It helps I didn't put any in. <laughs> so those definitely don't work. Not at all. <laughs> so let's talk about the basics. Now these are the three first B's. The first one is before. As a leader, it is imperative that you stand before your teams, your followers, however you want to refer to them, for a couple reasons. One, they need to identify who you are, who is leading us to this promised land, to this goal. 
Two, you need to be able to get up there in front of them and give them a vision of where you are going. What is it that we're trying to accomplish? Leaders are the face. Regardless of what District 53 does this year, there's multiple teams here. The person who is responsible ultimately for District 53 is that regardless of what anything else does, they're not going to look at the LGEMS, LJETs, area division governors. She's the leader. Everybody looks to her. So she is the face. She, like I and Rich and all the other past district governors, we die on the sword for it. Um, if, if need be, we will not put you in jeopardy. We take it ourselves. I used to always say, Beck was on my team. She'll attest this. If we succeed, we succeed together. If we fail, I failed alone because I didn't lead properly. So you need to stand before your group. But then you need to get out of the way. That's the key. Leaders don't often know how or when to get out of the way. So here's the, the next B in this process. It's to stand behind your teams. There are going to be times, occasions, when your teams are faced with roadblocks, issues that they don't know how to deal with something resources. You need to be behind them and support them. You need to be the one to get those roadblocks out of the way, the one to get them the resources they need. It's not the, I gave you a task to do, do it role. That doesn't work. You have to be there to support them. You have to have their back. How many people have been in positions where you th were on a team and all of a sudden, the help you thought was going to be there is no longer there. Nobody's got your back. Now you're left hanging in the breeze. Not a good feeling, right? What happens after that? Are you willing to help your leader out? Maybe one more time. But when they're not there the second time, guess what? You're on your own. You fail alone because you didn't lead. So now you're leading from the front and you're leading from the back. But you have to also lead from beside. I always tell my teams, I won't ask you to do something that I won't do. You're going to become overwhelmed. You're going to feel that you can't accomplish it. You're going to lose faith in, faith in yourself. That's when the leader has to be the cheerleader. They have to stand shoulder to shoulder with you. Pull on it together and get it accomplished. W without that, it's, it's like they're turning you loose without any direction, any guidance, or any support. These three are the building blocks for the bees to becoming successful. Let me put that in a Toastmasters context for where we are now. I made division governor. My team is made up of area governors. Now, my vision, my before, is I'm going to stand in front of my area governors and I'm going to say, we want to be a distinguished division this year, minimum. To accomplish that, what I want you to do is I want you to evaluate your areas, look at your low-lying clubs that probably will fold, figure out how we replace those, and then replace two more on top of it. I've given you a task. We have a shared vision. We're going to be a distinguished division with distinguished areas, and this is your role. This is what you need to do. And I'm going to try to jump over here without blinding myself. Um, this is what you need to do as the goal. So I've stood before you and given you a vision. Okay. Now, my area governors are all go-getters, right? Every area governor here is a go-getter. Yes, yes, every area governor here is a go-getter. Would someone bring the coffee in the room, please? <laughs> and they are out there. They're charging. They're looking for new clubs. They've identified the ones that are going to fail. They've already got plans in place for leads, for new clubs to replace those, and they've got three, four leads going down the pipeline. But they don't know where to go from here. Do I just say, I gave you a task to do? Go do it. 
Now, then I don't have their back, do I? I haven't stood behind them to help them accomplish their goal. I haven't provided them the detail that they need. They've gotten what I've asked them to do, but now I need to stand behind them and give them something. So I need to go to Eva Menon and say, Eva, I need demo teams. I need you to contact my area governors because they need demo teams. And Eva will contact them. So now I've stood behind them and I've given them resources. I've taken their roadblocks away and I've helped them continue to be successful. <clears throat> but now I get a call from my area governor at the last minute, they're panicked. They can't get everybody they need for a demo. They've got speakers and everybody else, but no one wants to be a Toastmaster, no one wants to be an evaluator. And we're meeting in a half hour, by the way. <laughs> what do we do about that? Well, start crying, I heard that. That's usually a good one at that point. Start calling to make a different appointment. If I'm available, I'm going to go out there and meet with them. I'm going to stand beside them. I'm going to pull that weight with them. We've all done it. When I was LGEM, I think I visited nine demo meetings that year, put over 4,000 miles of travel time to help them get to that goal. But I stood beside them. At no point in time in this list did they not know what they were going to do, did they not, did not have the support behind them or someone standing beside them to get it together to accomplish those goals. Those are three nice individual things. But how do you hold these building blocks together? And that's the struggle that I had when I was developing this philosophy. What holds this together? I could stand before you and run away, or I could stand behind you and run away, and beside you and run away, and nobody accomplishes anything, right? Well, that's where I came up with, see, the binders. What is it that holds these three building blocks together? Think of the binders as glue, or if you're a baker, it's the eggs, everything that you put in there to hold that dough together. Bravery. Okay. <laughs> so there's two binders that hold this together. Now, they may not seem obvious to you, but I think when you think about what they are, you're going to understand how they apply. So the first one is buy-in, right? Buy-in means that as a member of the team, you're going, you believe in what I'm saying, first of all, and you're going to do what's necessary to accomplish it. You are a quote-unquote business language self-starter, self-motivated, driven, those type of things. But you buy into my vision that I've given you by standing before you, You've taken on the task, and you are going to go and do what is necessary. You're not going to say, oh, I can't get a club, so I'm not going to do it, right? Um, we do have that problem, though. If area governors don't make their first set of visits and they don't become, run the risk of becoming a distinguished area, do they do the second? Probably not. Clubs who don't have 20 members to start with, they know they don't qualify for the DCP right away. If they don't have growth, do they bother to do the program accordingly? No. They know the program. They don't buy into it. So buy-in is a big thing for your teams. The second one is probably more important than the buy-in. And that's the believe. Now, I don't mean believe in the philosophy. I mean, believe in your leaders. See, oftentimes leaders get up there and they give you the virtues, they give you the strategic vision, they tell you they're going to be there. The minute they're not behind you, guess what? You don't believe them anymore. The minute they don't deliver on a promise, you don't believe them anymore. Once you stop believing in your leaders, everything falls apart. You stop believing. Now you don't buy in to what it is. You know they're not going to stand behind you when you need them. They're not going to stand behind you to help you out. And guess what? Their vision really didn't mean anything because they never followed through to do it. The minute you lose belief in your leaders, it falls down. Think about politics, and I don't want to bring politics into it, but we elect officials and we believe in them when we elect them, and they get up there and then guess what happens? We don't believe in them anymore, and then no one wants to support the programs or anything along those lines. It's belief. You have to believe in them. So those are the five principles that we have for this. We have before, behind, beside, 
Buy in and believe. Sounds great, doesn't it? How does it work? That's a good part. And see this little... Let's see this little Venn diagram here? I learned that word before I came in. It's a Venn diagram, all the circles up there. Because <laughs> I wanted to sound smart up here today. <laughs> see, they all stand alone. But they don't... But, but, but they don't... They don't do anything on their own. Right? Did I have the number wrong? There was... There's... I can do each one of these. I can be before, stand before you, stand behind you, stand beside you. There's nothing there. There's no success there. Right? It's just doing something. But if I do this, if I move them all together, where I'm utilizing each and every piece of the philosophy, there's an overlap. It's right there. You know what that is? Success. That's success. Now, success will vary depending on how you use it. If I move all my circles one over the top of each other, I've got 100% belief, 100% buy-in. 100% before you, beside you, and behind you, I have 100% success. But the minute any one of those circles falls out of that diagram, success goes away. Because there's no overlap anymore. There's no clue holding them together. How many of you have been in situations where these have applied, where you've seen loss of buy-in, loss of belief, people that don't stand behind you? I see it on a regular basis. It's scary. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you don't have to bring today into it, Dave. <laughs> There's always somebody in the crowd. Um, I'm going to show you how this applied when I ran for international director. And as I stated, I was the underdog. There, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it. I knew it going in, and because of that, I've developed my ability to do things on that. If you think you're going to win, and you go in thinking you're going to win, you usually lose. So we went into this, and I stood before my team, Rich Kuchar, Heather was on my social media team, Jeff Thomas on my web team, and I explained to them what my philosophy was for the organization, where I thought I could contribute. And my belief is that we change the world one member at a time. Everything we do changes something somewhere, changes the world. So that was the philosophy we ran on. They believed it because I was able to relate it. it I'm not changing the world all at once. I'm changing one person at a time. And then I sent them off to do their things. I sent Heather off to build my social media sites, and Jeff to do the web, and Rich to keep me standing upright. Um, but every time they came to me with an issue, something that needed to be done, something that needed to be addressed, I stood behind them. I had enabled them, but I stood behind them to make sure we accomplished the goal, make sure that they had the resources that they need. And when they needed help, when they needed a phone call, when they needed whatever, I was on it with them. I stood beside them and we pulled it together. They bought into it. They believed it for the entire time. I was jumping up and down here. This was a long process. It was a year of campaigning. Nobody's getting paid. We're making phone calls. We're traveling all over the place. Yet they still believed. They still had buy-in. And I never let them down, so they continued to believe in me. Well, when I met with my district leaders in Cincinnati, I used the same philosophy. I got them to buy into what I was saying. I gave them the vision. And we were able to convince a majority of the voting delegates that we were the right party. But if I didn't have any one of these items in there, if they didn't believe me, if, if I didn't have a vision, I'd be sitting here today and not here, not standing here. And, and that's the truth. So I truly believe that this philosophy, if you use it, you will have a greater opportunity for success in whatever the case may be. Now let's recap. 
I know we're well ahead of time and that's my goal. I'm going to give you time for questions, um, but I want to make sure our ship stays, stay, stays right on the right track today. A leader stands before, behind, and beside their teams. The basic principles. A leader gets buy-in from their teams. And teams must, must. It's, it's not, well, they maybe do or they maybe don't. They must believe in you as a leader. Without those items, success falls right down. I asked you to think about it when we started, if you've ever been involved with a team. No names. <laughs> no names. <laughs> no references, as indiscreet as possible. Has anyone been involved with a team where you saw part of these not working? No. Would you like to share? I'd be glad to. It's uh, not Toastmasters. Okay. <laughs> I love Toastmasters. <clears throat> My name is Jamie, and I'm from uh, New York, guys. So. And Jamie's the first time. Hi, Jamie. Hey. Hey. Uh, I love it, Toastmasters, because it helps me to be a leader in this organization. Uh, I didn't back up quickly enough, and now I'm chairman of our local professional society. And uh, we had a leader who uh, it seemed as though they really were most interested in uh, adding another title to their resume. <coughs> And so they really had very little involvement, uh, no commitment. When you needed something, you couldn't find them. You couldn't find them when you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. You stopped believing in them after that, right? You needed them, they weren't there. Yeah, yeah. So it, it applies everywhere. Anyone else? No? Everyone else is that very. Oh, okay. Janice, another first timer. Janice, how you doing? I'd like to actually add a B. You would. I'm not giving any copyright advancement on this, and there's no, we're not splitting salaries here. <laughs> it's a free gift. It, it is? That doesn't happen very often. I'll take it. <laughs> What's the B? Behavior. Behavior. Could you explain a little bit about what you think there? Once upon a time, in the not so distant past, <laughs> <laughs> in a place far, far away, I was being. Uh, shuffled around in my organization and found myself in a situation in which my on paper leader exhibited really bad behavior. And if you don't have the proper behavior, the behavior of a leader, the mm -hmm. behavior that people want to be part of, want to be part of your vision, then the belief collapses, the buy-in collapses, and it collapses backwards to where your vision is, basically you mold your people into everything you are not. There you go, excellent. All right, if you give me 10 minutes, I'm gonna rewrite the slide, I'll be back, we'll finish the presentation. Right. Everyone okay with that? No, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. That's the bonus B, yeah. That's the one that you uncover after you've undone all the other five. It's like, you, you, you scratch off the first five and you get the secret code for the sixth one. Bill, there, there, Bill I saw somebody else with their hand up. Oh, we got now we got lots of people stepping forward. Go ahead. I found D DJ? That, yes. Okay. I found that one of the weaknesses of some leaders, and my having been in leadership in the military, is the weaknesses behind. That's usually the first step in a failed leader is that they're not standing behind their people. Yeah. I found that many times there's a set of circumstances that happen that keeps a goal from happening or delays the goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a weak leader's first response is to start pointing fingers downward as opposed to looking at a process. Yeah. Sometimes it is a finger pointing. Somebody at a low level didn't come through, and that will happen. Sure. But more times than not, it's a process, set of circumstances, and having served in the Middle East, a lot of things don't go right. But the first reaction is not to point down, but it's to look inward and to back up those people. Yeah, that's that philosophy of for every one finger pointing forward, three fingers are pointing back. <laughs> oh, it must be me. <laughs> that's a, absolutely a, a great point, because that is the part that everything starts to trickle off of that. I, I know I saw a hand or two over here. How are we doing with time, Sharon? You got it. Okay, good. Thank you. So my name is Beth. I'm president of Lunchtime Toastmasters Club, and um, I actually left my previous position 
because I realized through Toastmasters I was not receiving the leadership I needed to be able to perform my job. So um, understanding the whole part about leadership and being able to learn that I need a certain type of leader now mm -hmm. in order for me to be able to perform at my best. I found that I was constantly trying to lead basically from behind, you know, constantly managing up. And mm -hmm. it, it just got to be too much. I couldn't take it anymore. Trying to push the spaghetti noodle uphill? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work so well. <laughs> Hi, Sandy. How are you? Welcome. Welcome. First timer? First -timer. Congratulations. <laughs> Absolutely. And we, we grow leaders, and we lead leaders by being leaders. It's, it builds one on the other. Yes, sir. I have actually experienced this without realizing it. Wow. Explain. I was a basketball coach. We had a draft, and the people that were in charge of everything placed us about fifth or sixth. We ended up second in the league. By doing basically what we have here, yep. Yep. It, it's it. Love, again, there's no guarantees that you'll always be successful, but there are things you can do that will help you get there, give you a better shot. Who else has something? Anyone? As I mentioned, a lot of it is bravery because even though that's not there, I think you're all. I'm Scott Davis, uh, president of Greater Bridgeport, and everything else, when I came on my journey, it, uh, Tom already believed in me, and he said, you can do it, because I exhibited some behaviors, but it takes a lot of bravery, because you don't quite know exactly how to do it, and especially when you don't have gold still, it's, it's a fun adventure. I'm not splitting my royalties with you either. <laughs> There's been way too many B's added to my list this morning. <laughs> Everyone's going to get an A by the end of the day, but we're starting out with B's. I can see that already. Norm, what do you got? I think one of the best things a leader can do, and many are afraid to do it, but one of the best things a leader should do right from the very beginning is look for a replacement. When you start to develop people under you, I think Jack Walsh from GE was the one that really emphasized that. Get out of the way. You know, get behind, get beside, help them. That's the beside. Is you get beside people and you help them become leaders. And if you're looking for someone to replace you, you, you lose your control. And when leaders begin to control mm -hmm. people, they lose. <clears throat> right. And I agree with that, but there's you have to be careful when you do that because there's an inherent danger and we've seen this we watch it in Toastmasters happen all the time it's that June 30th mentality everyone know the June 30th mentality right uh, June 30th out of here right oh okay well, I'm uh, happy birthday on June 30th but that has but that's when everyone rolls off their current position right and if they've already got somebody lined up really early in the program and the year's not going the way they want it to go, they start dumping stuff earlier and earlier. And June 30th usually occurs about January 31st um, for some of them. So it, I agree with you. You need to start thinking. Um, you just got to make sure that you focus. You know, uh, I could sit here and ask the senior team or anyone here, you know, what is your goal and on July 1st, and they may not know yet, um, but they're thinking about it. They just may not want to announce it right away. So, 
Yeah, I agree with you. We need to identify. Um, that's why I always say have an assistant. If you're an area governor, have an assistant area governor. If you're a division governor, have an assistant division governor. Helps unload some of the work for you. Make sure you follow our philosophy. Um, but then that person is prepared when they come forward, right? They've already had a year of training. When was the last time you got a year of training in Toastmasters before you took a leadership role? <laughs> no? Oh, we're doing something wrong. But that's really what it is, isn't it? It's like you're being drafted into position. Here you go, June 30th, you're Norm, and on July 1, you're area governor, Norm. Congratulations, now go set the world ablaze. But I don't know what I'm supposed to do. No, you're an area governor. You'll do it. You'll figure it out. I'm not going to be behind you all the way, and I'm not going to stand beside you if you need my help. Go do it. Norm's not going to be successful. Neither am I. We have any questions about the philosophy, how to implement it? Nathan. I've always thought of leading and managing day to day as being two separate things. Mm -hmm. It seems like you have a little bit of a mix, mm -hmm. and it seems like successful leaders are not just leading, but also managing a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak to how those are integrated? Sure, absolutely. And that's a good point because. Let's, Beth, do you mind if I use you as an example? Okay. So that is your district governor. And when she starts the year, her goal is actually strategic, right? It's the plan is on, on June 30th, we need to be distinguished or better, right? So she's a strategic planner there. So that's, that's that leadership piece, sending the ship in the right direction. Yet she still has to manage day-to-day -day operations to make sure that nothing gets missed. It's, if she said it was that strategically we're going to be distinguished or better on June 30th, but then she didn't manage day-to-day -day operations, if April comes around and we've lost 37 clubs and we haven't put anybody in the pipeline and we haven't figured out our leaders, the strategic piece doesn't apply anymore, right? It, it was just, it was a goal that was never reached. Um, that's like... How many of you, I know most of you that have been here uh, that have been area governors before, but the, the one thing on area governors reports that always bothered me is when you ask somebody what their educational goal is, I'm going to be a CC. When? June 30th. <laughs> really? <laughs> that doesn't work out because on June 30th, you haven't met it, you have no chance to make it. You got to set a goal of de December, January. So, so back to your point, Nathan. I think it is the strategic operate, the strategic planning to set the goal forward. That's if I'm standing before you and giving you my vision, my strategic vision, or the vision of where I want to be. That's the forward, long distance thinking. But in order to get there, we have to look, make sure that along the way we're meeting all those milestones, so to speak, along the way. So that's the managerial process. Now. Managerial may not mean that your hand is directly in it. Like if Bet has told her division governor she wants something out of them by the end of the year, she may check with them occasionally and make sure they're on track, but it's the division governor now that has to manage downward. So yeah, they, you can't have one without the other. Um, for example, board of directors, international directors, we're strategic planners, so we're building plans five years out. But I'm never gonna see them come to fruition until I'm back as a member because somebody else is handling the operations, the day-to-day -day piece of it. Would I like to be involved day-to-day -day and know that at least something's getting done? Yeah, probably, but that's not my, that's not my charge. Um, so it, they do, they have to go hand in hand, otherwise you'll, you'll lose sight of it. Thank you, great question. Anybody else over here on this side? Uh, Karen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go work my way across the room if that's okay. Karen? Can you comment on... Um... No. <laughs> So much of what you do as a leader, there's a fine line between leading and sometimes you just have to step in and do. Mm. You want to get it done. And I struggle with that constantly in terms of, so you're always, you always want to delegate and you always want to be focusing. Like, as a leader, you're, you're right. your job is strategic. You're supposed to be out in front and thinking ahead and planning. But sometimes you have to step back and you just have to, you just have to do. And I struggle with that constantly because I feel like I'm spending too much of my time doing mm -hmm. and not enough time strategically thinking and leading right. my team. So there's two pieces to that that are kind of an interesting balance. One is accountability, 
and how you hold the person that's not doing their job accountable, which we don't do very well. And the other is, when do we stop enabling people? Right? So if I have somebody who's not delivering, I'd rather stand beside them and lead them through the process. That way I know that if they have to do it in the future, they'll do it, than to just do it for them. And then they've never learned from it. They've never gained anything from it. Um, so it's, it's, that's that stand beside them. Don't enable them, help them do it. it. Sometimes you can't, I understand that. But if, if I can help make someone better by doing that, that's my goal as a leader. Not to, not to cut fish and, and cut bait and let them go. You know, it's, it, it, you're, not, you're not doing a good job as a leader at that point. Although it's, sometimes it's unavoidable. I do agree with you. My, my goddaughter called me up the other night, asked me how I, did, how, how I was with geometry. I had been out of school for a good 30 years now. I was pretty good at it when I did. but uh, So she sent me the, the problems and because she was having a hard time with it. I could have done them for her. I, I know how to do them, but she wouldn't have learned. So I called her on the phone and made her do them with me and guided her along the way. If I would have given her the answer, she would have failed the test the next day. So, so that's the delicate balance there. When you say, listen, you're not doing your job, you know, I'm holding you accountable, I'm going to cut you free, or let me show you how to do it so you can do it in the future. And by the way, now that you know how to do it, you're more valuable to other people as going along. Over here, we had at least one. Eva. I just had a comment in terms of leadership and how, how to lead. One of the, I've been working a lot on my business strategic planning, et cetera. To get the belief and to get all of that, you've got to have the vision. Mm -hmm. But you also have to have a vision because the vision is just, this is what we want. But how are you going to get there? So if you do not have the mission, we're going to do this by blank, 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 um, and then stand beside their team mm -hmm. and support them. It also helps when you have the vision and the mission, it helps you be much more crystal clear and say, okay, in order for me to improve Toastmasters, is it really important for me to have coffee at the meeting, or is it more important to have an agenda? So coffee. kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely coffee. <laughs> so that's what I mean. It just focuses when you have your vision and your mission. Right. It focuses everything and makes allows everybody to be pulling in the same direction. I've got time for two real brief ones, but just let me point coming out. You're next, and and then the then oh, you're just pointing over here. I'm missing this side of the room, so you're going to be my last question. So, uh, but I do want to point back to what you were saying, the vision. So the vision falls right here. The vision is on this before section, right? And if you, sh if you can convey your vision, then you get this. Bye. You get the buy-in. So those are the two parts that go right with what you were just talking about. You have a basic component and you have a binder. You're already part way there. Now you just get them to do the rest of it and stand beside them and you got it golden. I'm going to run over here for the one last question. What do we got going on over here? Hi, nice to see you over here. feel like a game show host. Hi, everyone. My name is Sugan Kumar. Okay. 6131 State Street. I don't have like a multiple piece of game with big coffee. It's more, I feel very critical. And even for you, for example, I'm sure you had a mentor. When you were going, I'm sure you didn't improve. This isn't that easy. So in my case, I just want to say, just a rich coach, or I don't know, if he's here, I can't see him. He went out the room. So he was my mentor, and he is mentor. He is right now not getting into my place in more than six months, but I call him up still, ask him <coughs> questions. Last night, at the, at the cafeteria, I called him up and said, I just have a few questions as to what to do for the next upcoming role. Right. So as a mentor, Rich is following this philosophy. And he's using that to help you become successful. So it all applies. Every step of the way, it applies. I'm out of time. I'm very cognizant of making sure people get to their next sections on time. We, I'll be around if you have any more questions. But I want to thank you for being a lovely audience this morning and being, being awake. Thank you.